place. We're going to worship God here this morning. Let's lift our, let's lift our voices and put our hands together. Let's give all the praise and all the glory. Here we go. Who is like him, a lion and a lamb, seated on the throne? Crowns is bowed down, and the ocean roars. Oh, who is like him? Who is like him, the lion and the lamb, seated on the throne? Crowns is bowed down. Every ocean roars to the Lord of all. Praise thy O God, from the rising of the sun to the end of every day. Praise thy O God, all the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise. Who is like him? Oh, who is like you? Who is like you? The lion and the lamb seated on the throne. Mount bow down, every ocean roar. of the sun to the end of every day. Praise Adonai. All the nations of the earth, all the nations of the earth, praise Adonai. From the rising of the sun to the end of every day. Praise Adonai. All the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise. Hallelujah. Oh, I said I wasn't gonna testify, but I couldn't keep it to myself. Oh, I couldn't keep it to myself. Oh, I couldn't keep it to myself. I said I wasn't gonna testify, but I couldn't keep it to myself. What the Lord? Oh, you ought to be there. You ought to be there. When he saved my soul. You ought to be there. You ought to be there. When he put my name on the road. Cause I started walking. Oh, I started singing. Oh, I started shouting. Gotta tell you what the Lord Oh, I said I wasn't gonna testify. I'm gonna testify, but I couldn't keep it to myself. Cause I couldn't keep it to myself. Oh, I couldn't keep it to myself. I said I wasn't gonna testify, but I couldn't keep it to myself. What the Lord has done. Oh, you ought to be there. You ought to be there.
Awesome and powerful and ever, awesome and great. 
this morning. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you and praise you. Lord, we love you and exalt you above all things, Father. Thank you so much for grace and love. Thank you for your ministering power and presence. We lift up your name and rejoice. Hallelujah, Lord, we realize how very, very much we need you, O oh God. Without you, we can do nothing, but in you, we are more than conquerors. Thank you for the love of Christ, the forgiving power that is in the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord, we rejoice. Thank you, Lord, so very much today. Hallelujah. We want to lift up uh, a number of needs this morning as we are uh, gathered together here. We are rallying our faith to take our needs before God. That's what this part of the service is all about. Whatever needs you have are pressing in on you, whatever miracle you may need, uh, this is a good time for you to make a connection with God, confess before Him your need, and trust that He has a plan and purpose. We want to lift up uh, this morning our services today, this morning and tonight, that God would move powerfully on our behalf. We need a visitation. We don't need religious services. We don't just need to gather together, but we need God to move on our behalf. And you can leave here this morning, uh, and by the service is finished, by the time the service is finished tonight, you can be a new man, a new woman, encouraged and strengthened uh, with God's might and power. So we're praying for that. We're praying for our country. Our nation needs desperate revival. Uh, our president and all elected officials, uh, we want to remember uh, military personnel. Uh, here in our church, stationed here in El Paso and throughout the world, uh, that God's grace would overshadow them. We remember also veterans uh, uh, and families of veterans and military personnel uh, that uh, also pay a price. Uh, and uh, we want to pray for police officers uh, uh, here in our church, uh, law enforcement personnel, uh, and uh, firefighters and uh, medical personnel as well. We want to remember to pray for Pastor Mitchell. Uh, he's preaching in Tucson today, uh, praying for God's grace over his leadership uh, in ministry. Pastor Harold and Mona Warner, God's continued favor and grace. Uh, Greg and Lisa Mitchell as well. We want to remember some of our pastors and missionaries, keeping in mind all the changes that are uh, taking place and that are going to be taking place very soon. Uh, we're praying for Vince and Nicole uh, Vasquez in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Joe and Julie Stevens in Georgetown, Texas, uh, Ramon and Patty Juarez in Mexico City, Sunshine and uh, Vinola, uh, Mensa in Ivory Coast, uh, uh, West Africa. We're praying for God's grace uh, uh, in their lives and their ministries. We want to remember to pray for Anthony Cobos and his family for God's grace healing. Uh, we're continuing to pray for Pepe Siqueiros, Mary Reina, Mrs. Emler, Jesus Molina. We also want to remember today Robert Cervantes, Manny Peralta, uh, and the Segalas family uh, for salvation, the Romero, uh, Dovenbarger, uh, Ramirez, uh, and Villanueva families, Joe Lopez, Hector Lucio, and Norma Ponce. Uh, those are all for... Uh, salvation, And I know this morning, as we're gathered here, as I've already mentioned, there are uh, numbers of needs that are represented by all of you. And I want you to pray, touch heaven right now, pray for one another, lift up these needs. Uh, let's believe God together that he'll break through and intervene in every heart. We're all going to pray together, believe God. Then I want to ask Pastor uh, Glenn to come and open our service in prayer. Let's go before God. Father, we thank you so much right now for ministering grace and power that is here to touch every life. You know the needs of every heart and your love and your precious blood. Hallelujah, Father, have, has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost to accomplish your will and your purpose. I pray healing and salvation and deliverance. I pray intervening, O oh God, in every situation and circumstance. Help the people of God deal with the burdens and the pressures of life and the trials that they endure. Or lift these heavy burdens, uh, provide hope and guidance and direction, O oh God. 
God, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And today, God, we're asking uh, that you establish your mighty presence in the midst of us. Uh, God, let there be an anointing that would flow from your throne, God, that would come down upon us, God. Uh, let our hearts be convicted, Lord. Move upon the altars. Uh, God, do a work that is beyond us. We commit this to you uh, in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Take a moment to greet and welcome one another as you're being seated. Amen. As you're getting settled in, we are very excited about today, all that God's going to do this morning and tonight, and we are uh, very blessed that you all are here this morning. God bless you. Thank you for being here. If you're visiting, we welcome you. If you're a regular member of our church, we're uh, always appreciative, very much so, of seeing you here uh, in our services. We're blessed and privileged by your presence, and also if you're new or Newer in the church, you've recently given your life to Christ, of course, we appreciate and value you. Let's give everybody a very, very warm welcome this morning. <laughs> Amen. We want to uh, make a number of announcements. Very important day today. Uh, this evening, we begin our schedule at 5.30 with prayer. Uh, remember from last Sunday morning, I've got a lot of comments about the message last Sunday morning. Uh, about the house of God being a house of prayer and you personally making it such. Uh, and so we want to do that tonight. We want to make this a house of prayer tonight and you need to make a contribution for that to happen. So uh, prayer meeting tonight before service is at 5.30. Uh, we pray in the fellowship hall and we encourage everyone that can to come. And then uh, we have our regular uh, evening service tonight at 6.30. I will be preaching a, a very special message called uh, The Power of uh, Forgiveness. And it is a follow-up to a sermon I preached uh, about two and a half months ago called The Insurmountable Debt. Uh, and you really do not want to miss this message. And we encourage, I know I say it every Sunday morning, but we really do encourage everyone to come back uh, to church on Sunday night uh, Another message, another opportunity for God to do something powerful in your life. Amen. There's nothing worth missing uh, what God has to say and speak into your life. So come tonight. If you're not in the habit of coming uh, on Sunday night, this would be a good day to start. 6.30 tonight, uh, the house of God open and we'll be in prayer and we'll be believing God for great things. So prayer at 5.30, service at 6.30. And then looking ahead into the week, we have regular prayer meeting uh, every morning from 6 to 9, the building is open. We encourage you to come to that. Uh, Tuesday night is women's prayer meeting here at the church at 6.30. This coming Wednesday, uh, we have a regular midweek service, uh, and I've asked uh, uh, Pastor Randy Jaramillo to preach this coming, or I didn't ask you yet, did I? In my mind, I did. So consider yourself asked. Amen. Uh, so he'll be preaching this coming Wednesday night while he's here. We're trying to get him out of here as soon as possible. Uh, not because, uh, well, we're just trying to get rid of him soon. So uh, uh, he's pioneering, going to be pioneering in Edinburgh, Scotland. Very exciting uh, venture for our church and for him and his family. But before he goes, I believe he has a word from God for the church. So uh, that'll be Wednesday, midweek service. Thursday, we have our Spanish ministry uh, Herman and Violeta Rueda oversee that. Uh, Herman is our Spanish pastor. That's at 7 p.m. every Thursday, Friday. Uh, we have our youth Bible study uh, and ministry at 7.30 here at the church. And then Saturdays, uh, uh, we have a great day every Saturday. Prayer at 10 o'clock in the morning, outreach at 11. And, of course, next Saturday is our Cinco de Mayo celebration uh, and ministry and outreach. We do that right here on our property. Uh, we've done this for the last several years. It's a great event, a great outreach. We get a lot of visitors that come out, uh, f uh, games and food and ministry and preaching and altar call, and all of that is going to be happening next Saturday night, and the event starts uh, at 6 p.m. That's the event, but the real work starts uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning with prayer and then 11 o'clock in the morning with uh, 
uh, our outreach for that event. And then two weeks from today, uh, we're very excited about having uh, Craig McLaughlin uh, come and preach a revival May 14th through 17th. Mark that down in your calendar. We have flyers. You can take those, pass those out. Uh, Craig McLaughlin was uh, my very first, one of my very first converts when I went to Cape Cod to pioneer. I believe he was 14 years old when he got saved in terrible turmoil, abandoned marriage, divorced parents, all kinds of chaos going on. And uh, over these last uh, uh, 37 years or so, he's been uh, serving God and he's now an evangelist. Uh, we had him here a few, several months ago. Uh, and he ministered a message that really connected with the church, and so we've asked him to come and do that. That'll be two weeks from today, starting Sunday morning. So uh, plan on being in prayer for that and attending those revival services. Uh, a couple of other items. There is a water baptism today, right after the morning service. Uh, so if you're going to be baptized, go straight out of the service, uh, change in the appropriate changing room, uh, and get ready for that. And if you want to be baptized and you have a change of clothes, uh, you can see uh, Ernie Lopez this morning, and he'll help you and give you direction. Bible study meeting at 6 p.m. tonight in the serious men's class. Uh, there'll be a Spanish outreach at 6.30 p.m. Monday, uh, meeting here at the church, and there will be an outreach for Cinco de Mayo Tuesday, meeting at 6.30 p.m. also here at the church. So Monday, Spanish ministry outreach Tuesday, Cinco de Mayo outreach both of those are at 6.30 here at the church. Sign up for the 5K in the foyer, uh, and we need uh, volunteers to support uh, the youth boot camp, so get involved in that and help us uh, with all of that. Okay, that's it for announcements. Ushers are coming. We want to take time to give and to worship God with our substance, our finances, our wealth. I want to give a plug for our Sunday school on money. I've called it uh, climate change and the coming economic revival, uh, but it's all about, uh, right now we're talking about uh, the personal dynamics of managing money, budgeting money, saving money, not spending more than comes in, credit card, and all of that. The wise management of money is necessary for the advance of God's kingdom. You say, well, who cares if I'm in debt? It's my problem. No. It becomes God's problem because God gave you power to get wealth for the purpose of advancing God's kingdom. And so if it's wasted or squandered, then God has something to say about that. So wise financial management is a character issue. And part of that wise financial management, of course, begins with obedience to God, with the tithe, with giving money over and above our tithes to the cause of world evangelism. Most churches function on a budget. Uh, that maintains the ministry, uh, the vast majority of our money that we take in here goes uh, to world evangelism, supporting churches. Uh, we're taking four brand new international works under our care. This is uh, huge amounts of money, uh, well over $100,000, $150,000 just to get these churches uh, uh, in place and operational and then the monthly support uh, uh, after that, we've taken on a huge uh, challenge and a huge endeavor, and we need everyone contributing, uh, beginning with giving this morning and tithes and offerings uh, and uh, getting your personal financial house in order, which is what we're trying to help you with. But let's celebrate, rejoice, uh, and be glad for all that God's doing as we give here today. Let's bow our heads. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, if uh, Juan Gonzalez would pray and ask the Lord to bless gift and giver. Yes, Lord. Amen. Let's sing and worship God as we give here today. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. I know that victory is mine. And I told Satan to get me behind. Victory today.
It slipped my mind. I wanted Raymond to uh, testify. Uh, we sent a band to Albuquerque, got a good report. He's going to share that with us very quickly. Amen. Yes. Um, we had the amazing privilege, privilege of going to Albuquerque, the band Steadfast, and man, it's happening over there too. The, I guess they call it the, um, was it 180 Club? Yeah. And um, it's it was packed. I'm telling you, it was, it was a great event. Um, God is doing something, not just here in El Paso, but everywhere. Four people got saved. We had a we we just had a tremendous time playing over there. And at our edges too, there's something happening. You guys go out, attend it, um, outreach for it. It's it's a great venue for people to come to be saved. They may not come to a church service, but they'll come to a concert, and that's where we deliver the message to them. And it's just a great event. And I thank you guys for letting us go and play, and let's continue doing stuff for God. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. One other announcement as you're turning to Malachi chapter 3. And I'm not preaching on what you think when I say that. Malachi chapter 3. Uh, next Sunday night is going to be a very important message. And I had wanted Ernie, and he's wanting to uh, preach uh, a message on the subject of prophecy. We have him teach and minister on that subject from time to time. The U.S., Russia, Iran, Syria, and North Korea, what does the Bible say about all of the current events? And things are happening right now. The very things that the Bible says, uh, we see them uh, in our newspapers today. And there is a crisis around the world, uh, and it's going to be very helpful for you to hear a, a message uh, that places us currently in God's time clock uh, and so he's going to be ministering on that next Sunday night. This is the day after the Cinco de Mayo uh, ministry and outreach. So that'll be a good venue to pass out flyers for it, uh, along with you taking them to work and school this week and inviting your friends and people that you know to come out next Sunday night for that message that uh, Brother Ernie will be ministering. Amen. Malachi chapter 3. Are you... Pursuing the call of God for your life as the senior priority of your life. That's what I want to talk about this morning. This is not going to be, I don't want it to be, a word of correction as much as it needs to be a word of inspiration. And when I say, are you pursuing the call of God for your life? You say, well, I'm not called. Yes, you are. Every single Christian, man, woman, teenager, whatever your age, whatever your background, whatever your orientation is, you have a call of God. There is a purpose for which you were created and saved. And from the moment of conversion, that needs to be the paramount senior primary priority of your life, and it's a very difficult challenge to maintain it as such over the long haul. What happened to them, really? What really happened to them, and it seemed to keep happening to them? And I mean over the long haul, over decades and hundreds of years, over and over again. There were seasons of revival, times of recovery, and repentance, and returning back to the premise of which I just spoke. And of course, what I'm talking about, when I ask the question, what happened to them? I'm talking about the people of God. What happened to them? And what kept happening to them? 
By the time we get to the book of Malachi, or as some say, Malachi, I heard that when I was a new convert. But by the time we get to the book of Malachi, the very last book in the Old Testament, the people of God are a shell of their former selves. And they have been for a very long time, and they would continue to be for another 400 years. As I said, Malachi was the last of the prophets. For the next 400 years, nothing, the Bible is silent, because nothing of any spiritual significance took place over those 400 years, which is unique. From Adam until this point, there is no 400-year gap of inactivity by God. All of the history is recorded. Some, not much happens, but something happens here, 400 years, not one peep. That's unique. And I ascertain from that, that's what they wanted. They wanted to live for God on their own terms. No more demands, no more requirements, no more standards. We'll live for you on our terms. Thank you very much. They were a people, I think, that wanted to be left alone by God. And here's my analysis. This is where I want to go this morning. This is my analysis of what happened to them, because that's my opening question, what happened to them. This is my analysis of what happened to them and what can happen to us and what may have happened to some and what may be happening to others if we don't guard and protect what we have. These people got bored serving God. That's what happened. They got bored serving God. They didn't want to forsake. They don't want to go to hell. They just simply got bored and weary of the challenges and the standards and the correction and the instruction and all of this talk about sacrifice and the will of God. They got bored serving God and they found other interests and they wanted to be left alone to serve God on their own terms. We should, we should be animated by the things of God more than by anything else. Our relationship with Christ, our pursuit of his will. That's why I ask the question, uh, are you pursuing uh, the call of God for your life? Our involvement and investment in the church should be paramount and primary in every life. And when other things animate us more, we're here because we have to be here. We're here because we got nothing else going on. But if something else that appeals to us, off we go. When other things animate us more, it can be the pursuit of money, can be recreation, when things like prayer meeting and outreach and serving in ministry diminish, we're no longer animated by such, stirred by such, committed to such, it could be a sign that you've gotten bored serving God and you're looking for something else to capture your imagination. I know that sounds a little harsh perhaps, but Stay with me this morning. I want this to be a word that inspires you. Not so much correction, but inspiration. As I preached 
the Sunday before our conference, my objective here this morning is to preach to 500 congregations of one. I want you to feel like God is speaking to you individually and personally this morning. The life of Christ in us. The pursuit of God's call for our lives as the primary priority of our lives has to be guarded. And it has to be protected. Otherwise, we're going to be diverted. And we're going to end up distracted. And no longer will things like ministry animate us. I have actually two titles for this sermon. One is what I've already mentioned. Are you pursuing the call of God for your life? I thought of that scripture when I was writing this sermon uh, in uh, Timothy uh, who has saved us and called us uh, with a holy calling, not according to our own works, uh, but according to uh, his purpose and grace which was given us uh, in Christ Jesus before the world began. So that settles the issue. You're called. The issue is, what are you doing about it? The other title that I have for this sermon is Living Above Board, which I thought was quite pithy. We have to find a way to keep ourselves from getting bored serving God, and some of us have failed in that arena, and I want to challenge our hearts with this message today. We're reading from Malachi chapter 3. And we're going to begin in verse 1. We almost never do that from Malachi chapter 3. It always starts in verse 10. But we're going to start in verse 1 and read just a few verses. And let's open our hearts for God to speak to us today. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will. I prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, he's referring to the Messiah, says the Lord of hosts, but who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering of righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. And I will come near you for judgment. I will be swift witness against sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away the alien, because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts, for I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob, yet from the days of your fathers who have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them, return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way? Shall we return? Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you. Thank you today for your presence, for your love, for your grace. I pray for anointing to minister this message. Let it bear fruit in every life. Bring, Father, conviction under repentance. And Lord, let every heart be stirred, motivated, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to do your will. We thank you in Jesus' name and all God's people said. I want to speak, first of all, about this idea of boredom. It's quite a fascinating subject, I think. I haven't thought along these lines for quite some time. And I want to talk about the taskmaster, the slave master that boredom can become. Your boredom can begin to make demands that divert you from God's will and God's purpose. Your lack of interest, motivation in the things of God can begin to be diversionary because the human heart has to have something that it is animated by and excited about. And if it isn't God, it's going to be something else. In our text, and in the book of Malachi, Serving God has become a hassle and an inconvenience. So what's going on here? God's terms for serving him have become an annoyance to them. 
Malachi 1.13 says, Oh, what a weariness. That's what they were saying about serving God. That word means toil or hardship. This is what happens when godly standards begin to chafe against self-will. Self-will begins to seek supremacy when you allow yourself to get bored with the things of God and begin to view the demands that, 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 that righteousness, obedience, and integrity puts upon us. We begin to view them as an annoyance, as an inconvenience, and as a hassle. And as a result, these people began to pull back. They're not tithing. Not only are they not tithing, but they're giving inferior offerings. They're giving the blind and the lame and the useless. What they didn't want themselves, they gave to God. They begin to discard serving in ministry. Marriage was violated and covenant relationship broken. And the whole idea and the premise of putting the things of God first above everything else in your life uh, had been abandoned. All these rules, that's how they're viewing it. All these rules have become tiresome to us. How irksome they have become. Do we really have to do thus and such? Isn't there another way? How about if we just simply serve God on our own terms. This is the condition as a result of disinterest and boredom. Boredom always looks for another way to occupy time instead of doing what you're supposed to do. In the text, there's no compelling interest, no energy, no animation, no, no passion, no zeal to give, to obey, to sacrifice and serve. And when you're not impassioned by the things of God, when the church and her mission and the vision that we are under the authority of has not captured your imagination and does not draw from you your highest level of commitment and faithfulness, something else will. And a lot of God's people, as much excitement as there is in the house of God at all times, there are people who can be vulnerable to getting bored with the things of God. The healthiest state for a Christian is to get yourself underneath the authority of standards, begin to serve, and be accountable. I'm saying that apart from conversion itself, the healthiest state of a Christian. When that becomes distasteful to you, I don't want accountability. I want freedom. I want liberty to do what I want to do. I don't want to be bound. I don't want to be underneath. Something to be avoided and discarded. You're going to find yourself in spiritual trouble in our text. They don't think there's a problem. Did you discern that? And if you read through the book of Malachi, as God begins to say, uh, thus and such is the problem, they say, well, how so? In the end of our text, uh, when God says, uh, uh, return to me I'll, uh, and I'll return to you, they're saying, what are you talking about return? What, what, do you, what do you mean? Later on in the chapter, they're not tithing, and so he asks the question, will a man rob God? I say, what do you mean rob? What, what are you talking about? They don't think there's a problem because they're still going through motions. They're still there. They're still identifying with. See, when your heart is right, the above is what animates you. Ministry, loving Jesus, worship, serving him, prayer, reading my Bible. Those things become what you want to do, not what you have to do. I want to read my Bible. I want to pray. I don't do those things because I have to. It isn't a hassle, and it's not an inconvenience. Boredom is a harsh taskmaster that expresses a ruling dimension. 
over people's lives. When you become bored, disinterested in the things of God, you have to seek out something else that animates you, and that becomes what you miss church for. It becomes what you begin to orient your life emotionally. It's what excites you. It's what animates you, as I've been using that word. It's what, it's what draws out of you uh, the joy and the happiness that you're looking for in life. Nobody wants to be bored. And when we are bored, we have to relieve ourselves of that boredom. Uh, and this is always a great threat to the church because... Any one of us, over the long haul of time, we can get bored serving God because uh, a lot of what we do uh, is, is the same things. Uh, we come to church, uh, we pray, we read our Bibles. They're daily habits, weekly habits, uh, monthly habits. Uh, these are things that we practice. There is routine uh, and there is regularity. Uh, and if you don't invest yourself correctly and appropriately, which I'll get to in a moment, uh, you're going to find yourself... Uh, Again? Really? We're doing this again? They're making another appeal. Here's another announcement. See, this is a threat to the church because it results in people being scattered in a thousand directions other than pursuing the call of God for your life. You have to and you will give yourself to something in life. And there are a lot of, and I'm choosing my words carefully, I'm not just saying things to throw them out here. There are a lot of demonically inspired things vying for your attention. The devil will use anything other than the will of God to capture your attention. Doesn't have to be sex, doesn't have to be pornography, doesn't have to be adultery, doesn't have to be some illicit relationship, doesn't have to be a, a stealing and violence and thieving and wrong. There are a lot of legitimate, uh, non-sinful things that, that are just as lethal uh, in the devil's arsenal uh, to pull you away from God's will. In fact, those very things can animate us so very much in life. Demas, having loved this present world. I mean, that sounds pretty innocent. He had an attraction to this world, to worldly things, to materialism. Here he is uh, running around the countryside uh, with the Apostle Paul, suffering, uh, being robbed, being left for dead, uh, being abandoned. Uh, and then they get to the big city. They get to Ephesus uh, or they get to Antioch. Uh, and there's the neon signs and all the lights and everybody's having a great time. Uh, and then back into the And he began to have a longing for all those things. Got bored with serving God. Paul, do we have to do this, really? And the Bible says, uh, having loved this present world, he forsook the apostle Paul, the rich young ruler. When challenged by Jesus to sell what he had and come and follow him, the Bible says that he turned away and went away sorrowful uh, because he had much riches. Uh, he chose money uh, over discipleship uh, and the pursuit of God's call for his life. When people are bored, they come under bondage. Bored people try drugs, don't they? Alcohol, violence. I almost got killed as a teenager. We're sitting around bored, getting high one day. We heard about this gas station. It's about one or two in the morning. Uh, one of my friends heard about this gas station where the pump was open and active. I didn't need gas. I, I think I had probably a half a tank of gas, but hey, we're bored. Let's go get some gas. So we went down to get some gas. I pulled up my 1960 Ford Econoline van, and I'm standing there putting this gas, feeling pretty good about myself, and all of a sudden, a guy comes running out of the gas station with a cocked 45 right at my head. He was drunk. The police ended up coming down. I don't know who called him. He ended up getting arrested. The police just shoot us away, and whew, my parents never found out about that one. 
Boredom is a slave master. It'll drive you in directions that you ought not to go. And when you're not animated by the things of God, you'll become occupied by something else. So let's talk about where this comes from. How can this emerge in our lives? You're thinking, no, no way, I'll never get bored. But you already have, some have. How can this emerge in our lives? Is it actually a possibility And has it already happened to us? Can we be honest enough to make a correct judgment? Here God is in kind of a wrestling match with these believers under the reign or under the ministry of Malachi. They don't see it. They don't get it. They're partially religious. They're involved. They're giving offering. They're in the temple. Their sacrifices, the priesthood is functional. But God has to intervene and bring correction. They're not quite ready to hear it or receive it. They need an explanation. What are you talking about? So let's try to determine what the roots of our boredom can be. In our text, there is no renunciation of God at all. When he says, you've turned away, they say, what? No, we haven't. Here we are. What are you talking about? You're not giving. Yes, we are. There's the offering. There's no turning away. There's no renunciation. What's happened is they've gotten bored with the intensity of it all. Listen, serving God is intense. If you're going to do it, putting Jesus first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. Listen, that's a radical enterprise. It's going to require everything that you have in order to pull that off, a willingness to love and to serve. And here these people have gotten bored with the intensity of it all. That's their problem. They don't want Jesus to be first. They don't want to have to give their best. They want to negotiate and they want to make a bargain and they want to figure out a way to live for God on their own terms. Have you, it's not an accusation, just asking a question. Have you ever become bored serving God, thinking, I gotta find something else to kind of excite me because this ministry is not really cutting it anymore? I don't wanna backslide, don't wanna sin, don't wanna go to hell. I still have a conviction about Jesus as the Son of God who died for my sins and I'm in need of forgiveness. I get all that. All of that is still intact and we can feel good about our affiliation with that. But that becomes the foundation of the number one problem and reason that we get bored serving God. And it has to do with what you and I allow our faith to become In our text, what's going on here, if you read the book of Malachi, these people have gotten into a price war with God. That's what's going on here. And this is the natural inclination of those who get bored. They wanted a faith on their terms that would cost them as little as possible and the least resistance to self-will. These are people that don't want to serve in ministry. They don't want to sacrifice. They don't want to give their best. They don't want to establish godly priorities in their, they don't want to have to do without, they don't want to have to sacrifice any sort of personal preference. They want to make the kingdom of God adjust to them instead of the other way around the kingdom of God has to be adjusted to by us. They had turned their faith into a bargaining negotiation. And to them, certain things became non-negotiable. Not tithing. We're not going to give our best. Those serving in ministry... We're not going to accept the standards. We want ministry. 
But we don't want to accept the standards, Malachi 2, for the lips of the priest should keep knowledge and people should seek the law from his mouth uh, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Uh, but you've departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. So they're still there. They still want the title uh, and the privileges uh, and the recognition of ministry, uh, but they've departed uh, from the high level of standards and accountability that's required. Not offering God their best, but the least they thought they could get away with. In chapter 1, when God is challenging them about the offerings, and they're saying, what are you talking about? God replies by saying, you bring the stolen, you bring the blind, you bring the lame, and you bring the sick. Would you give that to your governor? Would he be pleased with you? But in their rationale, all of that was cool, you see. They had... When, when God's bringing this very obvious, rational, common sense truth uh, to bear in their lives, uh, they're saying, what? What are you talking about? We're here. They wanted the tithe. They held it back for themselves. They wanted the best. They reserved that for their own use. Religious observance became a substitute for giving their best. They didn't stop observing. They just started doing it on their own terms. This is a description of much of the religious world today. A cheapened, self-styled, bargain basement, Faith based on our preferences and not on God's. Some people resent being held accountable. You're in ministry. You can't live on your own terms. Uh, there are expectations and there are standards. And I can tell you uh, how many times when I've called someone into question or had to uh, get an account for them about their behavior, their action, they resent it. Uh, they don't like it. Uh, they don't want, they want minute. You don't get ministry on your own terms. You don't work uh, for a boss on your own terms. If you work for a company, uh, there's dress codes. Uh, there's time in and time out. There's protocol. A lot of things uh, are regulated by others other than yourself. You don't get to march in uh, and, 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 and make demands uh, on how you want to serve and work for the company on your terms. You don't get to do that in life. And you certainly don't get to do that in God's kingdom. This happens by erosion, a long, slow process of letting things slip. We live according to high standards. We have convictions. We're functioning, flowing along, animated by the things of God, and then we make a little compromise. It bothers us at first, pricks our conscience, should I be doing this or not? But we allow it to linger long enough to where we feel comfortable with that little bit of compromise. And then down the road, there's another one and another and another and another and another. And pretty soon, what we have is no longer recognizable to what we once had. And that's why in the text, the word remember is used. Remember where you have fallen. Remember as in the days of old, as in former years. Things are not the same anymore, but they thought they were. They felt like they were. They didn't recognize that there'd been this radical shift and change in their lives. God had to try to bring it to their attention. So let's talk then about this business of making a return. Like a fire that will eventually go out if it is not fed fresh fuel, so too can the spiritual life diminish in the heart of any believer. Here it is, centerpiece of everything I'm saying. 
Boredom happens when you're no longer feeding fuel to the fire. If you're not in prayer, you're going to get bored. The easy answer to breaking the curse of boredom and living above board is to keep feeding the fire. Even if you don't feel like it, even if it gets wearying and troublesome and tiring, even if you're tempted to be distracted, even if you think that it's not going to make it, what difference does it make if I go to prayer or not, or if I fall on my knees next to my bed when I get up in the morning, or I read my Bible when I first, what difference if I miss a day or a week or two, uh, what difference is it, all? don't stop feeding the fire. When you stop feeding the fire, you're going to end up bored with serving God. Every act of obedience matters. Every time you come to prayer meeting, it matters. Every action of obedience matters. Every single day of your life, every outreach, every time you give, don't stop feeding fuel to the fire. If you stop feeding fuel to the fire, then the things of God can begin to be distasteful. And that's the biography of many a believer that has gotten bored serving God. See, this is how you feed ever-increasing faith. Your faith is supposed to grow. Love is supposed to grow. I'm supposed to love my wife more today than I did yesterday. That's what I'm committed to do, and I tell her so. When you stop feeding love, what happens? You get bored with your spouse. You get bored with your husband or wife when you're not feeding the fire. What are you saying to them? What are you doing for them? How are you serving them? You stop feeding the fire, you're going to get bored. And this is where adultery and pornography begins to make inroads. You've gotten bored, and now something has diverted and distracted you. Your relationship with God should be better today than it was yesterday. Your ministry. Your calling and the pursuit of it. Your giving, your serving. The more you feed it, the better it gets. If Ecclesiastes 7 8, the end of a thing is better than its beginning. That's not how life works, so uh, the beginning is always best, and then things diminish. You buy something new and it wears out. But in the kingdom of God, if you feed the fire, the end is better than the beginning. Haggai says, the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former. It gets better. Proverbs says, the path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more to the perfect day. Are things better for you today than yesterday? Are you more excited, more passionate, more zealous, more in love today than you were yesterday? See, the danger This is another second centerpiece to what I'm saying today. The danger is that somewhere along the line, you're going to make an exchange, the call of God for something else. And it may not, the something else may not be horribly evil or wrong or bad. It may be okay for some, but not for you, because it's not conducive to pursuing the call of God for your life. Solomon had it all. The son of a king, destined to take the throne, had calling, had a relationship with God, had wisdom in the form of of an answered prayer and a gift that God gave him, a superior wisdom than what was functioning in anyone else at that time. But Solomon got bored with it all, if you can imagine that. He cashed it in for worldly indulgences. He married multiple wives, had multiple concubines. 
And when his life was coming to an end, he's an elderly man now. He writes tragically, uh, it's all a waste. It wasn't worth it. There's nothing new under the sun. Uh, all is vanity. Uh, but he had to uh, make an exchange in order to learn that hard lesson of life. Uh, when you get bored, uh, beloved, uh, you're going to be tempted to make an exchange. Uh, and I pray to God that you haven't gone that far yet. People exchange all kinds of things for the call of God. They'll exchange money. They'll exchange a relationship. They'll exchange living in a place of their choosing other than where God has them. They'll make all kinds, because you've gotten bored, and now these alternatives become paramount in your life. In order to live above board and pursue the call of God for our lives as we all should be, we're going to have to invest ourselves uh, in what really matters, uh, and the reinforcing of that needs to take place at this altar here this morning. For many of you here today, it means just keep doing what you're already doing. You are feeding that fire, and you've learned the art and the skill that no matter how I may feel, no matter how offended I may become, no matter how tired or worn, not stopping, uh, I'm going to pray, I'm going to do the will of God, I'm going to love Jesus, uh, I'm going to put the things of God first. Uh, for many of you here, it means keep doing what you're doing. Uh, take this sermon uh, as a warning uh, that it's possible you could get bored with the things of God. Uh, don't let that happen. Don't slow down, don't give up, don't quit, don't stop, don't allow yourself to be diverted. Colossians says, uh, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, uh, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. All those things are possible. It's possible if you're not continuing in the faith, and as a result of that, being grounded and steadfast, it's possible to be moved away off of the foundation upon which God has placed you, off of the destiny that God has for your life. And that moving off of can happen so subtly uh, that you're moved off and you don't even know it. Like the people in the book of Malachi, they're not aware that it's happened to them. For others here, it may mean what the scripture says in our text, making a return. And I think that this is the most difficult of challenges. It's hard to acknowledge the people of God in our text and in the book of Malachi want to argue with God about their position. If you've let the fire diminish, if you've been moved off the foundation of God's purpose through boredom, you know, the interesting feature to this book, to me, is God's love, God's patience, God's grace. God is not saying, hey, if you don't care, I don't care. God cares more about them than they care about themselves. He cares more about their future and their destiny. He cares more about it than they care about it themselves. But sometimes that's the way it is. God doesn't say, hey, you don't care about me, I don't care about you. What he does say is return to me and I'll return to you. That's a revelation of God's love. It's a revelation of his faithfulness. It's a revelation of the fact that it's never too late. This very powerful word, return, that is used uh, twice by God in the text uh, describes, it's a, it's a strong word. We have the word return. It means the same thing in a lot of cases. But this is a very particular word uh, that means uh, from being furthest away uh, possible uh, to becoming closest possible. Return to me. You're about as far away as you can get is what God's saying. But I'm asking you to ascertain your true position in life. Come to grips with it and then come home. That's all God can do. All he can do is bring correction, make an appeal, try to inspire. Are you pursuing the call of God for your life? And have you learned how to live above board? Let's bow our heads this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody moving around for a moment. 
Every head bowed, every eye closed. We're on holy ground here today before God's presence. Perhaps you've come to church this morning. You're visiting our church. Thank you for being here. Perhaps you have come before, but you know in your heart you're not right with God. Now's the time for you to respond to this appeal. Jesus says to you, come. Now is the day of salvation. Today is the accepted time. Don't delay, hesitate. Put this off a moment longer. You shouldn't. You don't have to. You don't have to live in sin with guilt and fear. You can be free, you can be liberated, you can be cleansed from everything inside of you that is not of God. Every attitude, every sin, all guilt and fear. In a moment's time, Jesus can cleanse you. And that is what he wants to do. And so as our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Spirit of God is dealing with people. You're here, you're not right, you want to get right. I want to ask, I'm challenging you right now to make a decision. I can't help you beyond that, neither can God. Nobody can. I am a sinner, I need Jesus. That's the place you have to come to me. And I'm willing to pray and ask for God's forgiveness and receive Jesus as my Savior. That's the place you have to come to. It's not rocket science, it's not complicated. Getting to heaven is very simple. You're a sinner and you need Jesus. Your life is in turmoil. It's not everybody's fault. You made your own decisions. You can come clean and get right with God right now. And as our heads are bowed, as I said, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If you want me to pray for you, nobody's looking, every head bowed. If you want me to pray for you, I want to help you. I want to believe God this morning. I want to ask you to do just one simple thing. I would like you to lift your hand right now where you're seated. God bless you. Thank you for that. I see that hand. Anyone else? Lift your hand. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. God bless you. I see that hand. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I need Jesus. I'm ready to repent. I want to get my heart right with God. Now's the time to make a decision. God is dealing with you. God bless you. I see that hand. Thank you so much. Anyone else? God bless you. Amen. Anyone else? Lift your hand right up. I need you. There's a saving grace here today. A wonderful, loving presence of the Lord that's here to touch people's hearts. Lift your hand right up. Join these that have already done so. A number of people have already lifted their hands. You can too. Lift your hand right up. I want to repent and get my heart right with God. Maybe you're backslidden. Maybe some of what I preach really does relate to the condition. You got bored. You've allowed yourself to become bored with the things of God because uh, now you see it to uh, quit feeding the fire. Now look at you. A lot of elements of serving God have become a drag, haven't they? An annoyance, a weariness, as they say in the scripture, in the text. Oh, what a weariness. You need to get your heart right. You need to acknowledge your condition, quit arguing with God, quit bargaining with God, and get back to your first love. You're backslidden, you're going in the wrong direction, and you need to rededicate your life to Christ. I want you to lift your hand. Lift it high, right up. I'm ready, Pastor. I want to go on record right now. I'm going to get right. Once and for all, in Jesus' name. All right, if you raise your hand, I want you to look at me just for a moment. Brother in the back, you meant that. I believe that you did. Amen. God bless you. You meant that. Sister, way in the last row there, you mean that. I believe you did. Brother, over here. I believe you meant that. Over here, second row on the end. Amen. All right, I want you to come right now. I want to pray with you. Get out of your seat. You're going to come and find a place to pray. God's going to help you. Amen. Our heads are bowed. Every head bowed. Every eye closed. 
Nobody looking around. There are others here, perhaps, as these are making their way forward to the altar. You need Jesus. You need forgiveness. You need his love. And the Spirit of God is dealing with you. All right, how about it? Are you pursuing the call of God for your life? Have you learned to live above board? Has it happened to you? You've gotten bored with the things of God, and so you've looked elsewhere for something to animate you, capture your emotions, excite you, bring some level of fulfillment. Boredom is lethal. It has a ruling dimension that will pull you in a wrong direction in your life and you don't even recognize it because there's been no renunciation of the things of God, only a bargaining negotiation that you're going to live for him on your terms. Maybe this sermon is simply a warning for those who have Manage to live above being bored. You're feeding the fire, keep feeding it. Don't quit, don't give up. You need a place to pray at this altar. There are others here, you may be at varying levels of getting bored. It may even gone to the extreme. You've made an exchange. You're still affiliated, but what has captured your attention is something else. The two are connected. My first question, which was, are you pursuing the call of God for your life is the supreme priority? Are you living above board? The two are connected. I've watched disciples, their calling and the pursuits of it and the authority of it and the demands of it has bored them. They found something else that animates them. We need an altar to get back to our first love. Let's all stand. Altars are open. We're not going to sing. I want us just to pray. We all need an altar here this morning. And I want you to come and surrender. God, I know I need to repent. I've allowed myself to drift by not feeding the fire daily. And I have become interested and animated by things other than pursuing the call of God for my life, Lord. And I want to I want to get back where I need to be. Return, Jesus said in our text, and I will return to you. You've got to make the first step. You've got to acknowledge your need. You need to return. As in the days of old, as in former years, return to me and I will return to you, oh God. I give you my whole self this morning afresh and anew. And I come to you in brokenness, surrender, and repentance for allowing my life to become diverted, Lord. I've allowed other things to sit on the throne to distract me from purpose and calling. Lord, I want to be on fire like never before. Oh, God, I need you, Lord God, above all else. I repent for allowing myself to become bored by not feeding the fire. And I repent for entering into a bargaining negotiation, trying to live for you on my own terms, Lord. I renounce my terms and I embrace yours. And I'm going to live for you at the highest level possible of faithfulness and commitment and passion and zeal and love. Oh, God, pour out your spirit. Visit us at this altar today. Confirm your word, oh God, with signs and wonders. Fill me with your love, passion, zeal. Fill me with your grace, O oh God, your power, authority, and dominion. Let those things prevail in my life, O oh Lord. 
Moria Ravila Raba Sharia Ravila Raba Core Boriti Alaramando Rodorobo say. Oh God, I need you, I love you, I praise you, I glorify you, I worship you, Lord. Moria Ravila Raba Sharia Ravila Raba Karia. Come to this altar with brokenness, with surrender. Let it all go for God this morning. Something profound is happening at this altar here today. Oh, God, let there be complete brokenness in the house of God, surrender and repentance. Let there be the return that you have appealed for in this text, oh God, from all those who have drifted away from. Oh, Ria Rabi Laraba Karia Rabi Laraba Shore Boriti Alaramando. Yendere Alarabi Laraba Koria Rabi Laraba Sharia Rabi Laramande. Oh, thank God. God, touch every heart. Let revelation, the spirit of revelation, oh God, manifest in every life. Let there be powerful cleansing from all compromise and half-heartedness and lukewarmness, oh God. Oh, It can happen. We're not in church. It bores us. Why? That's what you have to ask yourself. Coming to prayer, not animated at the opportunity to be in a prayer meeting. Why? You have to ask yourself that question. You're not stirred to get into the Word of God every day. Why? That's the question you have to ask yourself. It must be God boring. Nobody wants to indulge in things that are boring. You have to honestly ask, and the things of God become that to you. In our text, the people of God got bored serving God and wanted to be left alone to serve on their own terms. I think we need to identify that as at least a possibility and then discern whether that has happened to us and then turn from it and return to the place we need to be. Let's all stand at these altars. Remain in place, every head bowed, every eye closed. There are men and women here, serious call of God on your life. We get used to our compromised position. We don't recognize that we're even compromised anymore. But over years, sometimes decades, then the Word of God comes to bring correction. We say, hey, what do you mean? What's the problem? Because we've gotten so used to our position. Only God can break through. In Jesus' name. I want this sermon to be an inspiring sermon, one that inspires you to get back before God and surrender all to Him. Acknowledge the need in our hearts. God, I've drifted away from the place I once was and the place you want me to be. There are men here, you've got, you got a serious call of God to preach. And you got bored. And now the Call is threatened by all kinds of diversionary interests that have nothing to do with pursuing God's call for your life. And you're giving consideration to making an exchange. Don't go there, please. Make a decision. Pray with me right now. Dear God in heaven, I come to this altar for the purpose of surrendering my all to you my best, 
my highest. No level of sacrifice will I hold back. I want to serve. I want to pray. I want to be in your presence. I long for your will. God, reignite those passions in my heart once again. And from this day forward, I will feed the fire. I won't stop. I won't quit. I won't give up. I know that every prayer meeting, every moment I can read the Bible, every stand of obedience matters, keeps the fires burning, keeps me from getting bored. I renounce spiritual boredom and I'm coming back to the fire and to full surrender. And from this day forward, I am pursuing the call of God for my life above all else. And I'm going to learn to live above board. In Jesus' name I pray. Let's worship God right now. Hallelujah. Oh, God, I praise you. I love you. I exalt you. I worship you. I glorify you. I thank you so much. Oh, God, you're worthy to be praised. You're worthy to be glorified. You're worthy to be exalted. Your name is high above every name. And there is no other name given whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, move. Oh, we come and ask you. Glorify. Just wait on God for a moment. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your ministering presence, for your word that is able to touch every heart, to meet every need, to address every issue in our lives, Lord. Thank you for revelation. Thank you for love and your care of us, oh God. Oh, thank you, Lord. Amen. God is good. Amen. Our heads are bowed. We're going to dismiss right now for rejoicing. Service tonight, the power of forgiveness. You don't want to miss that. It's going to be a great help, a great blessing. So be in church tonight. That's part of what feeding the fire is all about. And bring someone if you can that needs Jesus. If you're following up on someone and they're not here, call them today, visit them today, and bring them out. Amen. And let's believe God for great things. Amen. Our heads are bowed. We're going to dismiss in prayer. I'm going to ask if uh, Joe Russell would close the service in prayer and thank God for speaking to us here today. Bless you. Go rejoice.